Welcome to today's virtual Capital Science Evening. Thank you for your patience as we allowed attendees to sign into the platform. As a reminder, you can submit your questions at any point using the Q&A window in your presentation browser. We will now begin with introductory remarks by Carnegie President Eric Isaacs. Thank you. Uh, I'm Eric Isaacs, President of the Carnegie Institution for Science, and I'm really delighted that we can welcome back Dr. Rana Dajani uh, this, this evening. Um, Rana is going to talk about epigenetics, which is a fascinating and only too sadly timely um, topic in biological research that's emerging as a really powerful way to look at things. In particular, epigenetics, epigenetics is a study of ways in which things that you do, things that happen to you, the environment around you, affects the way your genome works, your, your genes work. And some of these impacts you probably know well, like, uh, like the effects of heavy smoking, long-term smoking, can actually leave a genetic signature on your, uh, leave a genetic signature, which can, of course, uh, be linked to cancers, to osteoporosis, many things, uh, cardiovascular disease. Infections that you get can also change your epigenetics or your genome in ways that weaken the immune system. And uh, one that's well known, of course, is that pregnant women, uh, a lack of adequate nutrition can change their baby's genome in ways that persist throughout that child's life until uh, through adulthood and cause things like heart disease and diabetes. Today, though, Rana will talk to us at a slightly different look at epigenetics, a different aspect of epigenetics in particular the impact of trauma, the externalities of trauma on individuals, and how trauma can, uh, trauma, traumatic events and trauma in general can transform us. Uh, just like injuries leave scars on your body, things like terror, abuse, and, uh, and the need to migrate uh, can damage your psyche. And, and you know, of course, of course, about the term PTSD. Um, but now that now Dr. Jijani is finding that the impacts of trauma can, uh, can be found all the way down to your genes, to the DNA. Um, and as we look around the world today, in particular today, it, that's a really sobering finding that the types of trauma that people are experiencing all over could ultimately impact them for, for decades, years, and even generations from now. So uh, Dr. Chichani, in addition to looking to the negative impacts, is also looking at ways in which resilience may also be instilled uh, and transmitted at the genetic level and how these impacts the positive impacts might be passed down to future generations. So I want to go back uh, and quote something from a century ago. This institution, Carnegie, was founded um, with the purpose of, and I'm going to quote this, read it, encouraging in the broadest and most liberal manner, investigation, research, and discovery, and the application of knowledge to the improvement of, of humankind. So these sound like highfalutin words um, and a bit old fashioned, perhaps, uh, but um, but I think uh, Dr. Dajani's research is exactly the kind of unconventional and really potentially revolutionary work that this institution was originally created to support and to promote. She brings uh, exceptional qualifications to the endeavor. She's a professor of biology and biotechnology at the Hashemite University in Jordan. She earned her PhD in molecular biology from the University of Iowa and was an Eisenhower Fellow, a Harvard Radcliffe Fellow, a two-time Fulbright scholar and a former visiting scholar at the University of Cambridge. Uh, in addition to her important work in genetics research, uh, Dr. Janani Dajani is also an extraordinary advocate for women in science, and especially Muslim women. She is the founder and director of the non-governmental organization We Love Reading, a program which strives to foster a love of reading in young children, largely in the Arab world. And it's through this program, the We Love Reading program, that she has trained more than 7,000 women to read aloud in, in Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, and has established multiple libraries of course, Jordan. And another connection, of course, to Carnegie, who, whose first real investments were in libraries for people to essentially read and, 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 and ingest everything that's around them. Um, and I, I don't have more time to go on and on about her exceptional, uh, exceptional accomplishments and honors. Uh, but it is a great privilege um, um, for me as a scientist to attend conferences all over the world. And I think the reason that it's the, the biggest privilege about being able to travel is you get to meet talented, really talented people from different backgrounds who might very well be trying to solve the same problems that, that you and I worry about. And that's exactly how I, I met Dr. Rajani in, in Berlin at a falling walls, so-called falling walls conference this past fall. And she and her work have really been an inspiration to me. So we're delighted to have her here. Um, I'll say a few last words and then turn it to her. 
uh, you know, if you think about today and, and think about what's going on in Ukraine and the barbaric invasion of Ukraine, you know, we see these haunting images of war and and so many Ukrainians being uh, exposed to this extreme trauma. You can't help but wonder uh, what's going to happen to those folks, not just in the next few months while they, they, they strive to live, but really how this will affect them down the road. So really honored to have uh, have Rana here with us today. And like you, I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. So please, uh, Rana, uh, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you very much, Eric, uh, for inviting me to, to share and to learn uh, today uh, with you all. Uh, yes, we met at the Falling Walls Conference, and that was amazing. Uh, and thank you for the introduction about epigenetics. Actually, I tell my students, do you dare continue and listen to the rest of this lecture? Because everything you do is going to change your, your DNA. Uh, so is everybody ready to take that dare, <laughs> both positively and negatively? Uh, experiencing how uh, my words and the experiences you're going to go through will change you forever. I'd like to um, introduce myself, in addition to the way uh, Eric so nicely introduced me, by, by saying that I'm a storyteller. Uh, and uh, storytelling, I believe, is fundamental to uh, how we evolved and why we survived. I believe there were two groups of people that's how I like to hypothesize way back in, in, during human uh, beings were evolving. One group of people sat around a fire and told stories, and the other one frowned upon those who were telling stories and told them that you're wasting your time. But you can imagine with me which group actually survived. It was the storytellers, because it's so fundamental to our survival. So in the spirit of evolution, uh, I'm going to share a number of stories as we go uh, through this uh, afternoon or ev early evening together. Uh, as I, I'd like to talk about the different roles I play in my life. Uh, and uh, people talk about wearing different hats. I don't wear a hat, I wear a scarf. So I talk about my multiple scarves, my, the five scarves that I wear. And the first one that I wear, and to me is the most important one, is that I'm a mother, a parent. And in that I'm contributing to society, to humanity, in the most important and fundamental way, because nobody can replace me as a parent. And I like to start with that one, uh, uh, always first and foremost. My, the, the second hat that I wear, or scarf, is that I'm a teacher. I was actually a school teacher for 10 years before I became a scientist. And those years were very formative in understanding the challenges that children, parents, and administration face in, in education, which is fundamental. And so my hat off to every teacher, and I think uh, anybody who's a teacher is actually playing the second most important role because our children, if they're not at home, they're at school with the teachers who inspire them and foster their curiosity and their critical thinking skills. And even as pro professors at the university, we are educators and continue to be so uh, throughout our lifetime. The third scarf or role is I'm a scientist and I will talk about my two fields of science. Uh, one is epigenetics of trauma and the other is ethnic populations in Jordan. But my, my scientific research led me to, to places that I never envisioned. And one of them was to work in policy, because as a result of discovering novel genes for diabetes in the two ethnic populations I study in Jordan, uh, I had to work with stem cells. And that led me to explore what are the laws and guidelines to work with human embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells as a Muslim myself. And when nobody had any answers, I had to, uh, you know, take the lead and spearhead the effort. And we created the first law to govern stem cell research and therapy, uh, not just in Jordan, but actually in the region. And of course, evolution is fundamental uh, to biology. We cannot understand nature without evolution. And so uh, I teach evolution to my students and uh, emphasize the importance of it and whatever controversy comes out of that as well, which is very interesting and uh, keeps us on our toes uh, with discussions and debates. My fourth scarf uh, is, as Eric said, I'm a social entrepreneur. I started a program to change mindsets through reading to create change makers, both in children and adults that has spread to 63 countries around the world. For my fifth scarf, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Uh, I invite you to read my book, Five Scarves, Doing the Impossible. If we can reverse cell fate, why can't we redefine success? So to leave some anticipation, uh, I wrote that when I was a fellow at Harvard, and, with, and it was reviewed in Nature. So with that introduction, I'm going to share with you uh, my journey as a scientist. You know, as a scientist, we have our heroes. And I like to invoke my heroes. 
usually around the world, uh, people talk about the heroes that they've grown up with. And I want to talk about, briefly mention them and, and uh, give them attributes. The first one is my father, who was who established the first medical center in Jordan and the first internal medicine department at the University of Jordan uh, and uh, really set the bar high uh, for medical services in Jordan. Unfortunately, he passed away two years ago. Usama al-Khalidi, who was, also, who was a biochemist, uh, and just uh, his birthday was on the 20th of April, and uh, they opened a whole new genomics lab at the, at the King Hussein Cancer Center in Jordan, which is a state-of-the-art center for cancer patients, not just in Jordan, but uh, in the region. Musa Nazar, another organic chemist who inspired me and inspired uh, many other students to, to you know, fall in love with the molecules and, and try to understand how they talk to each other. And Abir Bawab, a, a colleague of mine who survived cancer herself, and spearheaded using chemistry in our everyday lives and preserving uh, uh, old and ancient artifacts, uh, which are all throughout Jordan from Roman times and even uh, 12,000 years before that. So these are my heroes that I wanted to share with you as, and, and give them credit for where I am today. You know, but a scientist, as, as the title of my talk said, it is seeing what everybody sees, but thinking what no one has thought. And this is the hallmark, not just of a scientist, but actually of being a human being. Uh, and, and working with ethnic populations, and then the Syrian crisis happened. Jordan has always been a haven for refugees. This latest one, 2011, was for Syrians. Before that, the Palestinians. I'm half Palestinian myself. My father is from Jerusalem. And so uh, the first wave of refugees in 1948 came to Jordan. Uh, and then we have the Iraqi uh, war when it happened and the Iraqis came to Jordan and then people from Yemen and the Yemen war. And even now with the Ukraine, we have Ukrainian refugees coming over to Jordan. So Jordan has always been welcoming uh, to people from around the world. And, and I want to challenge the term refugee. Uh, when people started spilling in, especially in, in the Syrian crisis, it was, you know, these borders that border Jordan between Syria and Jordan. These are artificial borders. They did not exist 70, 80 years ago. It was all one country, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, Iraq. It was only with uh, uh, with uh, uh, British and French uh, occupation that these artificial borders were drawn. So when the Syrian crisis happened, it was family and friends crossing the border to stay with family and friends. And people opened their doors and welcomed everybody in. But unfortunately, with the, uh, uh, with the coming of international aid, with all good intention, these people suddenly became the other overnight because they were given the term refugees. So words really matter and terminology really matters. And we need to be careful of, of how we explain and, and explore and portray uh, the world around us. And as scientists, that is fundamental to who we are. So with this in mind, uh, uh, I saw an opportunity. You know, only scientists can talk about that in, 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 a, in, a, in a positive way while being compassionate and empathetic uh, to, to try to understand what's going on with the refugee population in Jordan, especially that the majority of them were children. Over 50% of Syrian refugees in Jordan are children. And these uh, children don't live in camps. 80% of them live actually in host communities, both rural and urban. And if we go to some statistics, just to talk about refugees globally, 68.5 million people are forcibly displaced. So one every one person is displaced every two seconds. And I'm sure these numbers have not been updated with what's happening in Ukraine. So you can imagine the extent of the, of the challenge. Uh, and 52% of them are below the age of 18. Uh, and the majority are coming from Syria, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and I'm sure we can add uh, Palestine, Ukraine, and other countries as well. Um, and, and I'm focusing on the Syrian refugee crisis because this is what I chose to study because it was in my backyard and happening as we speak in, uh, in real time. And Jordan has been a haven for over a million now refugees in Jordan. Now, focusing on the Syrian refugees, especially the children, they have significant mental health issues. 45% of them have PTSD, 20% are clinically diagnosed uh, levels of depression, and, and many other statistics of what they go through and what are the consequences of these, uh, of the traumatic events and of displacement on their lives as they grow older and pass through other generations. Now, most of the programs that are offered 
through international aid and humanitarian actors, focused in the past on providing food, shelter, basic health, and so on. However, what we've come to discover uh, in humanitarian aid is that we need also access to health, education, freedom to work, employment support, and not to live in a camp, but to live in a decent, dignified uh, community. And most importantly, looking at mental health. So we wanted to evaluate humanitarian action and to try to understand what interventions, especially those focused on mental health, uh, are effective in abating violence and promoting health. And how can we gather robust evidence for program evaluation under such humanitarian conditions? Because it's not easy, uh, especially in, in the context of war and displacement. So we wanted to really know what works for whom. So the issue of quality and depth of evidence regarding humanitarian public health programming, not just in Jordan for Syrians, but to learn lessons to implement them globally. And now we see that we really no need those lessons for what's happening in Ukraine as well. So I was part of a, I was in, uh, approached by Yale University, Catherine Panterbrick, to be a co-lead on evaluating such an intervention under humanitarian conditions. So this is an intervention that was being implemented by Mercy Corp, which is a, a large international NGO. The program was called Nubadir, or No Lost Generation, and it was being implemented almost over, uh, around half a million of war-affected youth in Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Turkey. Uh, this is a psychosocial intervention of eight weeks, and it was being in Jordan being deployed for both Syrian refugees and Jordanian vulnerable uh, teenagers as well. And what happens in these eight weeks is that the, cho the teenagers choose to participate in a variety of activities, ranging from sports to uh, uh, learning how to cut hair, uh, to woodwork, weaving, computer skills, uh, and so on. Uh, and, and supposedly what Mercy Corps had proposed is that this psychosocial intervention would reduce their anxiety and stress and improve their resilience. That's what they claimed. So we wanted to, uh, yeah, and, uh, and to help them heal uh, uh, the conflict that they had undergone as they were displaced into Jordan. So we wanted to study this intervention and see what does it work, how does it work, and can it be uh, developed to be better? And through this approach, we were able to actually uh, you know, target three major innovations in scientific practice that can be you know, lessons learned for other people who want to do such studies. Uh, and I'm going to briefly talk about the three points. One is the independence of implementation and evaluation teams. Second, talking about random samples and controls. And third, uh, utilizing methods of assessment that go beyond self-reporting. All these are high state-of-the-art science that usually uh, one uh, assumes that it is difficult to um, implement under humanitarian conditions. So speaking of independence of teams, uh, first of all, the, the teams, th this is just a snapshot of the different teams that we work together in order to evaluate this intervention. First and foremost, we, we had um, partnerships between international scientists and local scientists. I was representing the local scientists, being Jordanian and Syrian myself, and we had uh, scientists from Yale and from Harvard and, and from universities in Canada and England working together to design the research uh, and the surveys and the tools and the measurements, as well as analyzing the data uh, in a way that maintained the culture and the local identity uh, of, the, of the research. And these um, opportunities and these partnerships are kind of rare. And that's why this is a lesson learned on how do you create these partnerships with equal power dynamics, where every it's not just ticking a box that you have somebody local at, at the table, but everybody is really uh, putting in their weight and, and talking together as equals as we design and work together. The other kind of partnership is partnering between international NGOs and academia. Uh, and, and we were able to establish that between Mercy Corps as an international NGO and all of us as academics. And again, there's a you know, scientists talk, use a different language, a different jargon, different objectives, and international NGOs are looking for a different objective, different terminology. So crossing that bridge and, and uh, making sure that we work together to evaluate these programs in a rigorous way is also a challenge that we were able to overcome. Working international NGOs, partnering with local NGOs. A lot of times international NGOs come into a country and they, they do their work without really paying attention to the local actors on the ground, the local practitioners who know better the challenges and know better the solutions and will also maintain sustainability on the long run. 
So we were able to do that through our local NGO in Jordan. But most importantly is to seek those local academics to make sure that they are contributing. And sometimes we can't find them and we have to seek them out. And they may be in exile. And that's why I wanted to uh, raise the attention to uh, a new declaration that was actually um, announced, launched actually, yes, just yesterday uh, by the World Science uh, TWAS, the World Organization for Science and UNESCO. Uh, this is a, a whole effort of supporting scientists in exile from different countries. And we need this even more than before because of what's happening around the world. And this is a, um, a call for organizations and institutions to sign this declaration to support these scientists uh, to help them, not just for their own lives, but to give back to their countries by participating in such research projects because they know better uh, what's happening in their countries. So, so that's a, the first lesson learned. And most importantly, we also made sure that we were an independent team evaluating the, the uh, intervention that was developed by the international NGO. The international NGO was not allowed to be part of that evaluation so that they would be neutral and we would be able to assess as an impartial third party. The second innovation was doing a randomized control trial, right? Usually that's very difficult, but we were able to do it. There was extra funding so that we could have wait-listed controls who would, after we finished the randomized control trial, would be able to take the impl- intervention and help them deal with their trauma. How did we do it? We had a, a bag of lollipops <laughs> of two, two different colors, and every time a child would pick a lollipop, and at the end of the day, we would flip a coin to decide which color of the lollipop uh, was assigned to the control group and which one was assigned to the experimental group. And every day we would flip a new coin, so nobody really could guess which color lollipop would would, um, uh, make them end up to be in the control group or the experimental group. Um, And so the study design was looking at uh, almost 500 Syrian refugees and uh, almost 400 Jordanians. Uh, roughly uh, 14 years of age, 56% males. And we were looking four different areas in Jordan uh, where these uh, Syrian refugees had settled. And we assessed them at baseline eight weeks after the intervention and then a whole year after because we wanted to look at sustainability uh, of the impacts of the intervention and the longitudinal impact, which is also very difficult to do under humanitarian conditions. And the types of data we wanted to collect were psychosocial, self-reports, cognitive function through computer games, biomarkers, and genetics. So, which brings us to the third uh, innovation, which is the different methods of assessment. So we did the self-report survey, and just between you and me, I'm a, I'm a biologist, and I work with genes and proteins, things I can count, things I, uh, I can e- evaluate and measure. And then uh, I was introduced to this whole world of mental health, and making assessment using a self-reporting survey, which I was like, how do you know that that really portrays what's happening inside the mind of the child or, uh, or the teenager? And I was very, very skeptical. But I learned to be humble and to learn. And by the way, when you're going into another discipline, you uh, have a license, so to speak, to ask any silly question because it's not your field. But that is so enriching to the people in the field because you let make them uh, reassess their assumptions and push the limitations of their boundaries that they had got so much used to. Uh, And so uh, we had chosen a number of of self-reporting tools that we had measured, and we showed that the intervention, yes, worked for some, reducing stress and anxiety. However, for some, it didn't work. And that's a testimonial to the, um, uh, let's say, to the rigor of the research. If everything showed that it was improving or not, then something is wrong. But if some are improving and some are not, then I can trust that data and that research. But most importantly, it was the research team on the ground who was made of Syrians and Jordanians who actually, uh, when they were working with the children, they realized that the children would come out of a whole hour of this evaluation feeling uh, depressed and stressed because they're being asked about the trauma they experience and, and all the stress and anxiety. So because it was a local team, they said, can't we come up with a positive way to leave these children after this whole grueling hour of, of asking questions? And so we developed a resilience scale to measure the resilience of these kids so they would leave us feeling happier, which was also published and now highly cited and, and used, tailored to the local culture and the local context. And uh, science actually ran a, a whole special issue on resilience in which our work was featured. 
So this is shows the importance of having local teams on the ground to really know what's happening and come up with innovative ways and doing better science because uh, of uh, you know r identifying the challenges and asking the right questions. And and by the way, when we measured resilience, we showed that the intervention did not work for resilience, and the reason is because the, the intervention was developed by Western scientists in the West. And the whole resilience uh, component of the intervention was focused on building individual resilience. Well, in the Arab culture, Syrian, Jordanian, Palestinian, we build resilience through family and community. So the intervention had not taken that dimension into consideration. Hence, uh, the resilience was not being improved by their intervention. And now because of that, Mercy Corps has uh, uh, further developed their intervention to include family component and community component so that they can now really boost the resilience among these children. Again, uh, pointing to the importance of having local research assistants and local people uh, involved in the design and evaluation uh, 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 of, the, of the scientific research for these interventions. Now we go to the third component, which is evaluating cognitive function. The, the impact of stress on the brain. And with this, we were working with Margaret Sheridan at, uh, and Alexandra Chen from Harvard. So the kids were playing computer games that allows us to assess their cognitive function. And the surprising result was that it actually what really impacted their cognitive skills was not the trauma they had experienced, as most people would assume. It was actually the level of poverty that they were living with their counterpart, Jordanian vulnerable uh, teenagers. And this is a very important message uh, for the UN and for development as well as humanitarian aid, that poverty is it plays a huge role in, in cognition and, and healthy development of the brain of children. Lastly, we want to know this is where my field was. Yes, I want to look inside. I want to look at those biomarkers and see the impact of war and trauma, not just on your self-reporting, because your body doesn't lie. And so we wanted to look at a number of biomarkers. And, and the prime one was looking at cortisol. We know cortisol is a stress biomarker. It's, it's a measure of chronic stress. And it has a daily variation as well as a monthly variation. And I mean, there's different ways of, of uh, collecting data on cortisol. Cortisol is in your blood, so you could take it from your blood. It's in your saliva. But it's also in your hair. It deposits in your hair. And as your hair grows, um, every centimeter, like a centimeter a month, you have a whole history of how stressed you are for as long as your hair is. This is fascinating. And when we, when I went down into the lo local communities, the Jordanians and Syrians, uh, to talk to them about biomarkers, well, Mercy Corps was hesitant to introduce uh, the concept of looking at hair cortisol. They were afraid that this would alienate them from the community. And again, we said, you are neutral. You're not supposed to be part of this. We are the scientists. We're coming in as a neutral party to do the assessment. But the way we got bought in is that we sat with the, I sat with the families. I'm Syrian myself. I'm Jordanian. I'm Palestinian. And I said, hey, guys, I gave them agency. I said, we want to evaluate this intervention that's being implemented on us. And we want to check, does it work or if it doesn't? And how can we make it better? So this immediately, instead of them being the passive guinea pig with research done on them as subjects, they immediately became, had agency and this maintained their dignity that, yes, we want to know how this works and why it works. So we talked about how really to get under the skin, you need the biomarkers. And I said, well, how about we use cortisol? So everybody said, we're not going to do the blood. It's, you know, some people don't like blood. It's too messy, et cetera, et cetera. So we said, let's do saliva. And everybody, oh, that was even messier, right? Spitting into a tube, um, making sure you haven't eaten for half an hour before that. Forget about it. When I suggested hair, Everybody was over the moon. They said, oh, and I said, you're sure we could do it? They said, of course we can do it. We'll get a hairdresser. We'll make haircuts for everybody and we'll have a ball. And, and that's what happened. So the whole community had bought into the idea and we raised their level of, of scientific awareness when we explained where your cortisol is secreted, how it's a, a marker of stress. And we, so this, this is actual pictures from taking, you just take a hundred strands of hair from the back of the top of the head. And then we analyze the cortisol uh, in, these, in these hair strands. And, uh, and we showed that the intervention indeed reduced hair uh, cortisol. Uh, uh, and the kids were, that reflected the reduced stress and anxiety that we had measured through the self-reporting. Uh, and just to share a cool story, when we were doing the baseline, 
all the boys who were coming to the intervention had shaved their heads short because they were coming to this fancy program. And we said, oh, no, <laughs> we wanted the long hair. So lesson learned, you know, about explaining uh, the, the biomarkers and the data. Uh, we did other biomarkers where we didn't see any impact uh, for those who are interested, like CRP and uh, EPV virus. But that also speaks to the rigor that some biomarkers showed a change and some didn't. Uh, and this is the a team who worked with us. And this was funded by the Wellcome Trust in Eldra. Uh, but we wanted to do more, right? We wanted to look at genetics because we know that uh, different types of data offer different types of uncertainty. And some of the influence on our DNA comes from the environment. And so we wanted to look at a gene, which is MAOA. This gene uh, actually uh, is responsible for breaking down neurotransmitters, in particular dopamine, right? And uh, this is X-linked, meaning it's only it's males express one copy, so it's easier to study them in males. For females, it's difficult to study that because you have a second copy, which would mask uh, the, the only copy in males. And so we wanted to look at MAOA as a, in, in male teenagers in this study to see uh, what's its uh, interplay with trauma or perceived trauma of these teenagers, and if there's any relationship with the resilience that these kids were exhibiting. Now, we looked at MAOA not just because we know it breaks down dopamine and therefore plays a role, but also uh, MAOA is, uh, exists in human beings in two forms. It's very polymorphic. So some people have, we call it high activity variants because they have many copies of this gene. So they have a lot of that protein, so they're going to break down a lot of dopamine. And then we have those who have low activity variants because they have less repeats, and so they will break down less dopamine. So it was a perfect way of looking at uh, toggling the concentration of MAOA uh, inside uh, in these kids. All right, And we already know from previous research that variant variants of low and high uh, was associated with altered behavior when combined with early life stress. But nobody had studied it in the Arab culture or uh, the stress of war and trauma. So we wanted to uh, look at that. So uh, what we found is that for over time, that the children or the teenagers who had low activity of MAOA variant had actually less perceived, uh, well, less perceived stress. So it was better when you had the lower variant. And when we added the resilience component to see how that played the gene environment uh, interplay, we found that resilience had an additive effect with MAOA, meaning if you had high resilience and low uh, activity of MAOA, you had less perceived stress. So this was really important because usually only people study two dimensions, not three dimensions, and this was published in PLOS1. We also looked at other genes, and this was just published uh, April 4th, so very recently, and we looked at uh, COMT and 5-HTT uh, as well. Uh, and I'll leave that to, to you to, to read later. And, and so for this part of the talk, I'm going to end that. So when we study children and we see the impact of trauma and stress on them and then the impact of interventions in, in reversing the stress and the trauma, it's not just about the environment. It's not just about the genetic makeup. It's that interplay between them that we need to focus on and try to understand. And it's complex. It's not simple. Uh, so well, some of the hypotheses that had been put forward to explain uh, this uh, complex interplay is that for some children, they're more like orchids, meaning they're highly sensitive and have to be in the right environment. Otherwise, they're withered, just like an orchid. So it's not about, you know, responding to a, uh, an intervention or responding to trauma. It's about how, how sensitive I am to that intervention and how sensitive I am to that trauma versus dandelions who are considered to be tough and, you can, and can adapt to any situation no matter where they are. Again, it's about how they respond rather than what the intervention itself is doing or your genetic background. And then most of people or uh, humans fall in, in the middle, somewhere in the middle, and we call them tulips, right? So they're not that delicate and they're not that strong. So it's good to keep this kind of a background as we try to understand the response to trauma and as we try to understand the um, response to interventions. Again, the work done on the MAOA and the genetic environment interplay was done with uh, uh, Connie Mulligan at University of Florida and um, uh, as well funded by the Wellcome Trust and ELRA and the National Science Foundation. And a movie actually was done, a documentary was done about our work. It's called Terror and Hope, the Science of Resilience, which won uh, multiple uh, awards. 
uh, as you can see here. And I urge you, because most documentaries on humanitarian aid are done from the uh, intervention point of view, not done from the scientist's point of view. Uh, so this is a really good film showing how science can play a role in doing better humanitarian work. Now, coming to the um, uh, pivotal point of our talk, which is epigenetics, right? So we, as a phenotype, or how we manifest as human beings in our everyday lives and, and how we behave, is an interplay of our genetic makeup, our DNA, which we inherit from our parents, and the environment around us that impacts our DNA and, ch and changes what parts are expressed and what parts aren't. And we call this epigenetics. So how does this play out uh, at the molecular level? So our cells, in a way, they listen. Not, not really listen, you know, right? But they can sense what's happening around them. And they sense through certain receptors on the surface of the cells. The signal that they sense through the receptors, this signal is transmitted to the inside of the cell. And either elicits a very quick response, a cell crawls or moves away from something, or secretes something, or it elicits a longer response by turning on or turning off a gene. Turning on or turning off a gene by adding chemical modifications on your DNA. So it doesn't change the DNA sequence. It just changes which parts are turned on and which parts are turned off. And that's what we call epigenetics. Uh, and as you can see here, this is an image of the chromosome. And if you unwind the chromosome, you unwind the DNA, which is usually wrapped around proteins, which we call histones, we can see that epigenetic factors like methylation as a prime example, binding to your DNA and uh, not allowing it to unwind. So keeping it really wind tightly so you cannot express that gene. You can't uh, trans transcribe it into an RNA and then a protein. Now, to share some experiments in mice to explain how does really this impact your behavior, right? How do you take that molecular mechanism of epigenetics and translate it into behavior. So here, a prime example, and this is a, a documented research, where if you take a, a mouse pup, and these are all identical in terms of their DNA, right? And you expose one pup to a mother uh, that that um, does not take care of its pup. So it's a low nurturing mother, doesn't lick it, doesn't take care of it. Versus another identical pup who is being taken care of, of, of a highly nourishing mother that keeps licking the, the pup and taking care of it. The pup will grow up to be uh, more stressed and, and, and anxious if it's uh, taken care of by a low nurturing mother versus the pup that was being taken care of by a high nurturing mother will grow up to be a relaxed, less stressed pup. Now, these are all DNA identical. And so it's, the, it's that environment around the pup that, may, that makes it grow into two different kinds of, of pups. Now, what is really happening? When I say a stressed pup, we're talking their cortisol is pretty high. And usually when you're stressed, your cortisol goes up, in this case, the, the mouse. And then we have receptors for cortisol, uh, which we call the glucocorticoid receptors, that actually bind the cortisol and take it out of your blood, thus shutting down your stress response. Now, the challenge, what happens is that if I'm being taken care of by a low-nurturing mother, uh, the glucocorticoid receptor, the gene, is turned off. Hence, I do not have a lot of receptors on my cells. So when my stress hormone cortisol goes up, I can't shut it down because I don't have enough receptors to take uh, to reduce the concentration of cortisol. So cortisol is always high and I'm always stressed out. Versus a pup that was taken care of by a high nurturing mom where there was no turning off of the glucocorticoid receptor gene. So when my cortisol is high, I have enough receptor to bind the cortisol, uh, take it into the cell and reduce the stress response and shut it down. Uh, so it goes down to that at the molecular level to that, and we know that uh, uh, we know that we can that this kind of response has an evolutionary theory behind it. That if a mouse is being taken care of by a, a low nurturing uh, mother, it, the mother is low nurturing because there's stress around in her environment, so she's preparing her pup to also deal with stress. Similarly, if the mother is not stressed, then it's helping the pup to deal with a low stress situation. So there's an evolutionary uh, mechanism behind uh, preserving this kind of response, and it's not hasn't been eliminated by natural selection. And we know that these epigenetic patterns are reversible. We can reverse them by injecting uh, uh, certain drugs to reverse that methylation on the gene and turn on the cortic uh, corticoid receptor uh, uh, as well. So these are experiments in mice. Now, if we go to humans, we know that uh, to understand epigenetics, it's a journey through life. So starting from a zygote, 
uh, growing as a fetus uh, in, in the uterus of a mother, and then as the child is born and grows until old age. You have the same genome. It's your epigenome that changes with the environment around you. And, and the, the maternal exposure to the environment, whether it's stress or alcohol and drugs, nutrition, et cetera, impacts through DNA methylation and histone modification, as well as other non-coding RNAs, the fetus inside the mother's womb. And this results in adult onset disease like diabetes or hypertension or, or obesity, et cetera. And so the disease risk lie over your lifespan from early life to midlife to late life at the bottom of the slide is impacted by your epigenetic modifications that comes from your social determinants of health uh, indirectly and then directly from the social determinants of health like your socioeconomic status, education status, et cetera, and your race and ethnicity. Now, all of this is looking at the negative impact of, uh, of trauma on the human being as a conserved evolutionary mechanism. But what I wanted to challenge and uh, Eric alluded to is looking at the positive impact of trauma. Uh, does, is there a way that we can cope in a positive way with trauma and stress? Uh, from an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense. We've evolved, we've survived multiple wars and in-group and out-group uh, disagreements, and we've been able to thrive. So there is a positive component to this. And when I first came up with this idea, people said, oh, Rana, you, the, first, you can't talk about that. You're celebrating trauma. And of course, I'm not celebrating trauma. I'm just being an objective scientist trying to look at both sides of the situation and not just being caught up by the negative, which is always sensational and everybody wants to pick up on. I wanted to look at it from a positive and maybe because I'm an optimist. <laughs> uh, but people said, no, you can't talk about that. And And because to me, this is a whole new field, I was kind of, okay, let's get the evidence out. And then this review came out last year, reviewing the role of epigenetics and psychological resilience. There's a paucity of research, it wasn't enough, but it was, a, it was written as a review. And to me, it was like, I should have written about that. And that's a lesson for everyone. If you have a good idea, just trust your gut feeling and go ahead. So in that sense, we what we want to do now is to look at the epigenetic clock, which measure, which is also a factor of aging. So the more, uh, as you age, you have you accumulate more epigenetic markers, and that uh, accelerates your aging depending on what you were exposed to. So whether you're exposed, your gender, uh, uh, obesity, uh, stress, all that infectious diseases can accelerate your aging clock through epigenetics. But also, you can look at the positive: your lifestyle, eating healthy, having a healthy social uh, environment around you can deaccelerate. The epigenetic aging. And so this clock was actually tailored for pediatrics for children by Michael Kober at the uh, University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And he showed that this clock can be impacted by intrinsic factors, uh, meaning gender uh, uh, as the child grows, physical and social environments around the child, and then interventions that can, that can actually reduce or accelerate uh, that epigenetic clock. And, and this clock is what impacts the health and developmental outcomes of a child as he or she grows up. So this is where I was able finally to marry my social entrepreneurship community work with my scientific work. First, they were in two separate worlds, and now they, they've come together. And, and so We Love Reading, as I said, is about changing mindsets through reading to create change makers. So we train uh, adults to read aloud to children in a face-to-face -face social interaction. And we've discovered that the impact is not just on the child and the adult, but on the whole community, uh, boosting early childhood education, reducing mental health uh, and boosting resilience, and fostering social entrepreneurship and a mindset of I can. So what we, yeah, so, and we did some research to prove the principle that yes, this intervention can actually improve executive function like working memory, emotional regulation, which makes children do better at school with Brown University. We showed with the University of Chicago that the intervention improved empathy in children who were read to versus those who weren't. And we were also able to show with Queen Mary University, Isabelle Merchel, that we uh, that children who were exposed to the intervention actually improved their emotional perception. They used to identify children uh, faces that were happy as sad because of the trauma they had undergone in the war. But then after We Love Reading, they went back to normal. Uh, so, yeah, showing how such a very simple intervention can actually reverse the adversity experienced by children. Uh, and New York Times had written about us. We just won the Schwab Award uh, for Social Entrepreneurship from the World Economic Forum this earlier this year. And a documentary was done, which we can share that uh, link to the trailer later, following one of these We Love Reading ambassadors who reads aloud to the kids how she has changed herself uh, and, and, and the children around her. 
So, yeah. 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 Think. Well, yeah. So what we did, what we wanted to do was to look at the impact of the intervention on the epigenetic clock in these children. Uh, because we, we, had hypo we wanted to see, does the children who take the uh, intervention, their pediatric clock is different? What are the factors that influence their response to the intervention? And whether there are sleeper effects of the intervention uh, on a longitudinal uh, time scale. And these are the specific aims that we had uh, designed. And this is going to be a randomized control trial assigning children uh, randomly either to take their intervention or not and then give them the intervention later on and follow them over a longitudinal um, a time of over a year. So this takes us to the last part, which is, okay, if I'm exposed to environment and this impacts my, um, how my, which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off, does that impact of the environment stop with my lifetime or do I pass it on to next generations? And that's a, a very important question. We know that it happens in animals, but we really, nobody's actually been able to test it at the molecular level in human beings because we can't use human beings as guinea pigs and we can't design these um, uh, experiments and do randomized control trials. As I said, we know in mammals, 1% of genes escape epigenetic reprogramming and continue to the next generation and can be found in second and third generations. So we wanted to ask, can we detect a pattern of epigenetic inheritance across generations in human beings. And in order to do that, uh, we wanted to look at a mother that was exposed to trauma, the fetus inside her who was exposed directly to trauma through whatever his mother was doing or her mother was doing, and indirectly if the mother was transferring her epigenetic signature to her uh, baby, and whether that went to the third generation. And because of the intricate knowledge of, of the Arab community, I was able to identify a, a co cohort of people who were exposed to trauma in 1980. So there was a huge massacre in Syria in 1980 where over 20,000 people were killed. So we took grandmothers who were pregnant at that time in 1980 and identified them as the first generation traumatized. And then we, we took samples from them, their daughters and their granddaughters. And then we had another cohort where the grandmother was not exposed to trauma, but the daughter was in the, in the 2011 Syrian crisis and her uh, daughter. And then we had a control group where neither the grandmother nor the daughter nor the granddaughter was exposed to trauma. So this was an elegant, intricate uh, design that could only have happened because of the knowledge of the history and access to the people so that we could really answer that question. Can epigenetic impact of trauma be transferred across generation? And is there a positive uh, impact, uh, positive signature uh, of resilience as such? And that's why I called my talk The Immortal Kiss of Our Grandparents, which my daughter said, Mom, this is all about so our, the immortal kiss of our grandparents. And this is work that was funded by the National Science Foundation, working with Catherine Panterbeck at Yale and Connie Mulligan at the University of Florida, and ongoing. So we're actually analyzing the data right now. We finished data collection. So stay tuned for next year when the actual results come out and we answer that question. So uh, I'm going to end by saying I think every human being is unique. Uh, because their DNA is different from any human being that has ever existed, will exist, or does exist. And even if you're identical twins, your, your epigenome is slightly different because you've slept on the right side of the bed or the left, or, or you got an extra kiss from your mom. <laughs> so it's, you're slightly different, and therefore you have something to give to the world. And I urge everyone to think what can they identify around them and create a solution for to better humanity, help us achieve the SDGs. And if somebody says, who do you think you are? You're just a drop uh, in the ocean. You can tell them, but what is the ocean but millions of drops? So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions and comments and critiques because that's how we learn and grow together. Thanks, Rana. That was, uh, that was really terrific. Um, so, uh, let me start with just a high-level question about the, the state of the art of epigenetics and how, how much it can be used as a science to be sort of predictive, right? Um, you know, genetics has come a long way, but still has a long way to go in terms of being able to predict just because you know someone's genome doesn't, know, doesn't mean, partially because of epigenetics, doesn't mean you can predict they'll get cancer, they'll live to 95, those kinds of things, because so much is dependent. So can you just comment a little bit on this whole business of epigenetics um, and where 
you know, how, how much is it becoming a predictive science? Right now, you've been talking about doing analysis after people are forced to move or after people experience trauma. Um, is there a possibility that epigenetics one day gets used to, in advance of trauma, I mean, to start predicting who's most susceptible to different kinds of trauma, like what's going on in Ukraine? Uh, just a general question about the state of the art of epigenetics. Yeah, one has to be very, very careful, first of all. You know, as scientists, we, we, we talk about these things, we talk about our experiments and, and how we design them and the results that we get, but we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, draw conclusions more than the da what the data says. And, and it's always um, tempting <laughs> to, to go into predictive mode and, and to, uh, to think that we, because of the knowledge that we've gained, that we have the power to predict. And we need to really be careful about that. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, as you said, the more we know, the more we realize we don't know, the yeah. more we realize how complicated and complex uh, uh, behavior is, and that it's a manifestation of, of uh, m millions, trillions of interactions uh, between cells and molecules in our brain, uh, that I don't think yeah. we could, yet, yet we have the audacity and the courage and the boldness sometimes to be predictive. And sometimes yeah. we predict correctly, and that could yeah. be an illusion. So we need to be very careful and always cautious. And, and why? Because we don't want to put people into boxes and, and uh, determination and say that this is it. You're, you can't change. No. What I want to say is because of what we know about epigenetics, it opens the whole door of possibilities that you're not fixed in your DNA. You're not fixed in what happened in your childhood. Actually, the whole world is in front of you all the opportunities yeah. for you to make a difference in your own life. And that's the message that I'd like to be transferred and conveyed because of this research. So um, I'm just going to push this a little further. Um, we had an interesting comment about Phil Hopkins about, uh, about laws involving the privacy of genetic information, but not necessarily for epigenetic triggers. And so, and presumably there's a lot of data out there, right? Taken by insurance companies, hospitals, by doctors, et cetera. Is that kind of information useful? I mean, you, you went in and you did direct, uh, you directly uh, interrogated, if I can say it that way, people through discussions, through, as you mentioned before. Is there a, a vast amount of data out there that's possibly usable for the kinds of studies that you're doing? And, and even to get to a point, maybe not predictive, but at least seeing trends in the types of trauma that affect people in maybe deleterious ways? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's plenty of data out there. Uh, and one has to be careful to make sure that it's an all anonymized when you collect it and gather it and, and to preserve people's privacy. But yes, yeah. there's a wealth of data. But it's about observation. Again, it's back to the scientists. It's about looking for the trends, identifying them, and then making sure it's not a fluke. And it's not. It's really statistically significant. And it, and it holds up to reproducibility and uh, replica replication, especially if you're generalizing something about humans in general and not something particular to a particular ethnic group or a particular experience. So right. all these are fascinating ethical questions that we have to deal with. And by the way, usually ethics is always running after the scientist, never catching up. And, yeah. and, and that's good to start thinking about these questions early so that we don't fall into the trap of doing something that is not ethical. So do you believe that scientists ought to be involved in those ethical conversations, or is that the role of, uh, say, the philosophers and the politicians? Oh, I think it's, it should be both. Because yeah. if you don't have the scientists to explain the science, the ethicist is, is not going to know what is the limitation or the, uh, the boundaries or, or the unlimited boundaries of what could happen as a result of this scientific discovery or that piece of information. And I think yeah. nobody should take any decision on ethics unless it's a group a committee, and that's what we did with the stem cell law in Jordan. We had a group of people. We had lawyers, physicians, scientists, religious scholars, all the stakeholders, and each one explaining their perspective, their point of view to the other, so that we could come up with a consensus. Because again, as a scientist, we also don't understand what are the ethical manifestations of what we do sometimes, right. and we right. need to be aware of that as well. Do you feel like in the work you're doing uh, now, um, given these very multidisciplinary interactions you're having, is that is there an uptake in, in you know, say in Jordan or elsewhere that you're aware of where people are paying attention? I mean, of course, people pay attention to wars and, and, and trauma and people are, you know, and all these kinds of things. But in, in, in particular, these, these sort of scientific impacts, the genetic impacts, do you get a sense that um, the right uh, politicians or the right um, the people who care about 
about people's lives are, are paying attention to epigenetics yet? Do you think it's something that is going to be used to help make decisions and policies and politics? Um, I think uh, the pandemic, COVID-19, has raised awareness to science and the importance of science and, yeah. uh, and uh, boosted science communication in a way uh, because it was so pertinent to our everyday lives. But the silver lining here is that now they're more aware of science. And so, yeah. yes, the concept of epigenetics is out there. It's being discussed. But again, I, I think the onus is on scientists to be better science communicators, to explain yeah. what it is and not to be taken out of context, right, in a negative yeah. way, uh, and to use it in a positive way as well. So we scientists have to train ourselves on science communication, and as well as raising awareness amongst our students to be better ambassadors of science, because our students may not, who take basic science, may not end up being scientists, but politicians. And I think the best politician who understands science is somebody with a scientific background. So also raising awareness early uh, at the university undergraduate level of science communication and uh, how important science is playing in our everyday lives and using COVID as an example. Yeah. Um, let's see, I want to come back to the science of epigenetics, the, the, the effects you talk about where the gene is impacted. I guess I didn't quite fully understand what you had said, but, but trauma itself, so these externalities imposed on someone, uh, doesn't actually change the genome, but it, it may change what is expressed by the genome. Is that correct or by the genes? Is that is that a correct statement? So what is yes. it that's actually getting passed from generation to generation when it, if it's not a change in the genome itself, right, the, 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 if you will, the, the, um, um, the, the roadmap for human life, what is it that gets passed from mother to daughter and daughter to granddaughter? Right, so throughout your lifetime, your cells accumulate these uh, epigenetic signatures from the environment you've been exposed to. Now you have most of your body's made of somatic cells and they die with you, so it doesn't matter whether whatever they've accumulated. But your your um, uh, your reproductive cells, they're accumulating epigenetic signatures as well, and they don't die with you. They are the ones that are passed to the next generation, right? If it's a sperm or an egg. Now usually what happens at the level of the, when the sperm and egg unite and you have a zygote, all epigenetic signatures are erased and you start yeah. fresh. But apparently not all. There's a certain number or percentage of epigenetic markers that slip through. And that's, those that slip through are the ones that carry over the experiences of the uh, either parent to the next generation. Now, yeah. what are those 1%? That's what we want to understand. How yeah. do you, which one is chosen and how, and how they manifest? That's the question that we're trying to answer. Yeah, it's interesting. There's some great questions coming in. And this one I just have to ask because it's not unrelated. It's about how we, you know, we as humans, we can often blame or resent or, you know, our, our grandparents or parents for what they did down the line, whether it was drinking or smoke. Yeah, I'm sure my mother smoked when I was, you know, in the womb and who knows what impact it had on my, <laughs> on me and my epigenetics genetics. But I guess the question is, are there studies being done about, you know, not just resentment, but also forgiveness and how, how to think about these impacts? You know, of course, they've given us all of their genetic material, but they've also done other things that they, you know, today we're not supposed to drink out. You're not supposed to, women don't drink alcohol when they're pregnant. They certainly don't do bad drugs. So is there, are there studies going on that relate to that inheritance problem? So you mean about the, how to deal with it from an ethical, psychological well, point of view, well, or the actual, the actual positive maybe impact, not just the negative impact? Well, That's I mean, what you're well, saying. I mean, there, you know, there's a sense of, of, you know, we thinking about our grandparents and maybe, or maybe being very positive about it. But, but I, I guess the question is, is there an epigenetics study to, in, a sense, in some sense, separate out what, you know, what the emotional piece is from the, from the, the scientific piece, the piece that, you know, that you couldn't control or the piece that maybe you could, but, but, you know, didn't know better. Mm. It's, a, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure I'm, I'm stating it exactly right, but it's a different study, a different angle, which is the inheritance. Yeah, angle. no, I see. Uh, yeah. yeah, I see what you're getting at. Well, we, we, we will not be able to tease out the emotional from the actual uh, right. na natural nature one until we understand the molecular one. When we understand the molecular one, then we can say, okay, so this is emotional, this is molecular. But in, until until then, it's too complicated to, to identify which is which, right? Yeah. And that's why the study we're doing is so, so important. Because through our study, we've created an intricate control system. Because we're taking yeah. not just the grandmother and the daughter 
and the granddaughter. We're actually taking two granddaughters uh, as sisters to be controls for each other, one exposed to trauma and the other not. So we, we, we've kind of designed it in a way that we could answer that question to a certain extent. Yeah. But of course, this is one study and there, a lot more should be done. And maybe yeah. others are being done, but haven't been published yet because they're still yeah. in the, uh, uh, being, you know, happening as we speak. Well, I, I think what's really fascinating about all this is, to me anyway, is that, that your studies that you did are, are essential for epigenetics, but it does combine the biological science, molecular biology with social science, right? Because it really is about studying that whole social piece to it without, which is comp probably even more complicated than the genetic side. So it's a, it's an interesting, and that's why I guess I asked that question earlier, which is, is there, is there a real way toward a science to a predictive science? And you kind of pointed out, well, complex, it's very complex. So it may not be uh, a perfect science ever in some ways. It's it's actually what keep what wakes us up every morning, right? It's it's that yeah. spice, that zest, that unanswered yeah. question right on the horizon uh, yeah. that we'll always be searching. And if we answer that question, another question is going to come up, I'm sure, yeah. uh, yeah, to yeah. keep us uh, thriving. Yeah. So I think we're getting we're actually a little past the end, and I I, I really want to be respectful of your time. It's it's uh, Ramadan. You probably want to go to sleep and <laughs> and wake up and you know. So, but. Um, I want to ask one more question, which is more about your um, We Love Reading. We had a, a couple of questions about that. And maybe you can spend just another minute talking about, you know, how much and how often do you do these programs? You, you mentioned, I think you've touched 7,000 uh, uh, kids. Is that the number? So maybe say a little bit about, um, you know, what types of books you use and and what it is that, uh, you know, and how, how, how you think about that program. Yeah, thank you for, for, for the questions about the We Love Reading. It's my, 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 my project and, I, and it's like my baby. <laughs> so what we, what we do, we've actually, uh, the philosophy behind it is uh, uh, helping a child fall in love with reading so that they become lifelong readers and therefore lifelong learners. The challenge of education today is that we, kids are not interested. Everything's online. Why should we you know, go to school? And, and we, we're also preparing them for a world we don't even know what it looks like. So the idea is, is foster that love of learning, and then they'll handle whatever's going to come in their way. And, and even if in the most dire situation, they will seek opportunities to learn because they yeah. want to, not because they have to. So how do we do that? What, how do you get to that, that mindset? And it's, by, it's human nature by focusing on desire and passion. So making a child fall in love with reading. And how do we do that? We train adults to read aloud to children on a regular basis in their native language. And these adults are volunteers, uh, any age group, any sector, any background, because all they need to do is read a children's book. And, right. and so it's a very simple program. And they read anywhere in the neighborhood. And they're not paid. These are volunteers. Now, the result is that this is a very simple program, hence scalable, universal. Right. But it right. is so localized. So it's like that, that, that harmony between diversity uh, and unity that we find in nature. Uh, manifested in this program and uh, and we read books from the native language from the local culture so those are the types of books our training now is online in 10 languages and growing so anybody can take it and uh, and anybody can start it in their own neighborhood it's it's that yeah. simple and by it's the way great. all the world needs it both developed yeah. and developing and people can check it out on our website are you so are you tracking uh, are you tracking the impact in some way are you are you looking at I mean, oh, presumably not oh yeah support. Yeah, well, so how, we've impacted the, so, uh, the methods. Yeah, so we've impacted 7,000 adults, but we've uh, uh, reached half a million children. Ah, the way okay. we've approached measuring impact is also very innovative and unique. We don't believe in just counting numbers because people could count numbers, but that doesn't mean the actual person has changed. So what we do is we do storytelling, and this is a new way of measuring impact, real deep impact. Oh. Uh, so we do storytelling. And then we, we gather that through a mobile app we've created where these ambassadors can report what's happening with them in their environment. But more importantly, we do deep dives of uh, rigorous academic research to prove the point. So uh, we have so many, we have a multiple uh, peer reviewed uh, uh, um, articles published and you can find them all on our website, studying different aspects of the child. Uh, and I mentioned just a few in my talk and even of the adult looking at how she or he have changed. And the majority of the adults are women, by the way. So, so we have the storytelling and uh, to show the anecdotal evidence, and then we have the hard 
core deep dives of rigorous research. So marrying those two ways of measuring impact, we have a real picture of change that is a, an impact that's sustainable rather than just, and we have the typical statistical report of how many people trained and so on, which I don't very much believe in, by the way. Uh, yeah. I, I want to see the real impact inside, and that's what we do. That's great. So I want to thank you again, Rana. That was just terrific. I think you know we had some great questions. Unfortunately, I couldn't get to all of them, which is a good sign. People were really excited about what you were saying. Um, also really great to hear about, uh, about that we love reading and I definitely want to come and visit you at Hashemite sometime. <laughs> You're more about You're more things. than welcome. <laughs> and uh, and thanks again. And and um, you know, and I also want to thank our audience um, to uh, for their great questions, for for tuning in and listening to what what is really an interesting, a really interesting topic. Obviously, an emerging epigenetics is an emerging field, and I'm just very excited to see how well it's doing. So thank you so much, Rana, and thanks again to the audience. Good night. You're welcome. Thank you. Good night.